<laughs> I hope my director was, uh, would have told me, uh, Munea, <laughs> I was caught off guard there. But good morning and welcome to Power Breakfast. My name is Fred Indimuli. This is how we do. We want to take a look at the headlines this morning. A quick look at the standards. Kenyans wait for poll servers. Reporters rile IEBC fight. Of course, that's a big headline. Uh, the Supreme Court and what's happening uh, surrounding the presidential election petition is a big news this morning. Also, the Daily Nation, Riler's plan to unseat Uhuru. That's the headline as it reads on the Daily Nation. Of course, uh, quite a number of pages inside the dailies today have been dedicated to the presidential election petition. Although for the Daily Nation, page 2 and 3 have to do with the plastic bags ban, which kicked off yesterday. It's also been highlighted on the front page in plastic bag ban life anew. That's the headline on uh, the Daily Nation, also highlighted on the standard. Relax, you can keep your plastic bags just for now. We'll be discussing that and what it means uh, because there's a bit of confusion and some people have been complaining that police have been harassing them. Uh, yes, uh, the first two pages of the Daily Nation have been uh, uh, reserved for the plastic, uh, plastic uh, bags ban. But the election petition, the presidential election petition, which is already before the Supreme Court uh, on the Daily Nation, we have page 4, 5, 6, eight nine yes up to page nine on the standard it started from page four five six seven and eight yes N ten page ten also and uh, the standard has done a very good spread highlighting uh, the issues around the presidential petition and breaking down even it's much easier to know which lawyer is representing which team it's very interesting now uh, for this news review this morning we're privileged to have let me start with uh, Mark Bichachi a political analyst Mark Bichachi is with us also with us is Dan Stanomari an advocate of the High Court and uh, Dennis Indumbi a political analyst also has been a candidate for Senate for Nairobi as well as Charles Kipkole another political analyst Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Of course, there's a lot to be said about the presidential election petition, but uh, because uh, we run the risk of being subjudiced, we'll stay away from the merits or demerits uh, that, uh, of the petition. Of course, that is before the highest court of the land. We have to respect that. And so we will not discuss uh, the issues surrounding that petition itself, but we'll look at a lot that happened in the Supreme Court and what we expect to happen today. Of course, uh, Jubilee... Uh, not Jubilee Party. Jubilee Party is not part of the respondents. The third respondent who is President Uhuru Kenyatta. His team of lawyers will be making their submissions today. Of course, that team is led by Fred Katia and Ahmed Nasser Abdullahi. Those are the lawyers representing President Uhuru Kenyatta. It will be interesting to see how, uh, what they say and what they submit before the judges today. Uh, but just looking uh, at the few happenings from yesterday, and we'll be looking at quite a lot, including the lack of space in that courtroom, the kind of dressing we're seeing, uh, how the judges are behaving, the wigs, the language, and of course, just like my panelists today, there's no female, and I'm wondering why we're not even seeing any female lawyer uh, actually coming up and uh, making a name for themselves, because it, it also appears, like, uh, and Dunstan, you're an advocate uh, of the High Court, uh, explain to me, it looks like this is a season. Or this is an opportunity for people to make their names. Uh, such a petition presents that opportunity for senior counsel and lawyers of not, and those who want to aspire to become uh, serious lawyers in this, in this country, to actually come, be seen, and make their names. Isn't that so? Our well, lad, it is the other way. If you can come and uh, try to make your name, you can also come and destroy that what you think you have mm -hmm. and uh, also I don't know whether they have been given a chance to come and expound themselves I'm, v I'm very definite that my colleagues both from the female and the male gender as lawyers they have the capacity and the qualification to argue and present views as they have been trained for the very many years that uh, they have gone to law school so in my own view I don't see the question of incompetence or the question of being shy it is the opportunity and uh, Freddie if you tell me if you t tell you today there will be very many but the arguments are more political the arguments are more party lined 
the, 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 even when you look at the lawyers, the objectivity in terms of uh, uh, in terms of really the issues that are on, on, on court has been lost. Kenyans have become so polarized so that when you look at uh, a, a particular position, people are looking at that particular po position from either an ethnic or a party position, mm -hmm. not from a very objective angle. So it is very few people who will come and be very objective and look at the issues as they are presented. The same pattern of voting is what I've seen all over. When you look at even the, the representation of councils uh, 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 in court, very rarely are you seeing a difference of party affiliation mm -hmm. and legal representation. It's more of a prosecute uh, lawyers and everybody's prosecuting this case or analyzing this case based on what they believe. But what they that, believe. shouldn't that be expected that all these lawyers have uh, their own political uh, affiliations as well? And of course, uh, even as a client, I want a lawyer who believes in me. Uh, and who believes in my stand politically because these are political parties and uh, these are political players uh, in before court so definitely even those who represent them have to believe in their own ideology it's not like uh, when you're uh, uh, prosecuting a criminal case dancer when uh, the training we are undergone as lawyers is that you cannot treat yourself neither can you treat one of your your relatives so that when you are an insider of a political party you have you lose objectivity and I saw it in court yesterday the question of people not even able to read the object uh, objectivity of the arguments that are coming from the other side you've seen in that court sloganeering you've seen about the question about uh, party loyalty well that could be a political question that case in court mm. has seven pillars one there is the political aspect of that case and when you look at the composition of the lawyers, you will see most of the elected members of parliament or senate representing the political aspect. There is the question about the historical aspect of the detention and where the history of the court was, the, the security of tenure of the judges. You've had it being mentioned that at one time it was criminal to imagine that we could be here. So there is that historical aspect of that case. The third one is also the question about the religious aspect of that case, mm -hmm. where people are saying that this is a God-given uh, result, or this is not rightfully done. There is the, anybody could not have said. Fourth, there is a therapeutic aspect, whereby the loser will have undergone a certain curative aspect, where people must accept that the Supreme Court now is the finality of this case. That is the fourth issue. Fifth issue is a political question. I've seen in that court people avoiding the legal question and telling the, the, the judges, instead of addressing the judges, mm. they are addressing behind their party, their party loyalists. Of there course. is also the last aspect that I've seen in that case from the lawyers is the question of uh, a, a, a blend of one technocrat lawyers Two, emotional lawyers. Three, fluent lawyers. Four, grammatical lawyers. Fifth, lawyers who want to carry the day and build their name. Yes. So that is uh, is a totality of the legal profession. And that's exactly Dunstan. We'll be looking at that. The kind of flair <laughs> and the kind of uh, the way the lawyers <laughs> behave in court, the way they talk. And there's some of the very interesting discussions even on social media overnight uh, because I was, I was looking at some of the discussions and uh, one particular lawyer, uh, specifically Pielo Lumumba, when he made his submissions <laughs> yesterday and people could not stop talking about it. <laughs> Up until now, people are still talking about <laughs> Pielo Lumumba and his submission. We'll be talking about uh, the different uh, ways and different styles that these lawyers are approaching uh, or uh, uh, employing as they make their submissions. But Charles Kipkule, what are you seeing different? Because yes, this, it may be a very tedious and very boring uh, process to watch even on TV as uh, these submissions are made, but Kenyans are really watching. It is uh, very interesting and uh, yes, uh, we are looking for some of those uh, moments when we can actually see some flair from the lawyers uh, but uh, the question is how come and even just looking at the courts and even the photos that we have apart from the uh, the bench where we have two female judges uh, on the bar 
we're not seeing the female uh, lawyers this time round and it is a bit worrying last time we remember in 2013 that's where uh, the names uh, like uh, Kathy Kilonzo came up we saw a young female lawyer make her name uh, through that presidential election petition this time round we do not uh, look like we can hope for anything of that sort well I think uh, Fred thank you for having me this morning and uh what we are seeing here in terms of the gender representation is actually a picture of our society as it is. Even the, the composition of the bench as it is, uh, we are only seeing uh, two female judges out of the seven. So naturally when you look at the, the, the legal teams that are representing the both teams, uh, naturally there will be this preposition of uh, just going for the more established the the one the, the lawyers who've been in the game for a while and when you want to look at people who have been there for long then naturally if if before the new constitution came in the issue of gender and gender just trying to bring women into the picture in terms of governance representation and all that was not so prominent when you look at all of these lawyers they've been there for over 10 years meaning that even before the clamor for gender uh, gender equality came into our country this these women may not have gotten a, a proper platform to engage themselves, which is why we are seeing uh, women are, are victims of the late entry of the gender issue into our society. And uh, going forward, we hope that uh, probably, I don't hope for many other petitions, we hope for an election where after the results people will shake hands and say this is it. But if at all another comes, then definitely probably we may see one or two women being even lead counsels in these uh, cases, but as of now, this is an indicator of our society as it is. Because uh, both, uh, all the parties involved have teams of lawyers. It's not just one single lawyer. Of course, there's a lead counsel, but it's, it's a whole team of lawyers. Uh, I'm sure there must be some females within the team. Dennis Ntumbi, how come we're not seeing any female lawyer uh, coming up or at least getting an opportunity to make a presentation because some of these arguments, of course, mm -hmm. they've been discussed, they've been researched on. It's just making the presentation in court. I think certainly the thing to note in this country is that, uh, you know, both politically and I think also in the judicial system is that, uh, you know, we are fighting a, a, a patriarchal system. And if you look at patriarchy, certainly is, uh, the men get to make most of the decisions. They dominate a lot of uh, where the power plays. And certainly the thing about this country is that everybody has to fight for their space. Unfortunately, we are seeing the same in this uh, parliament that uh, uh, it risks not being sworn in or sort of what we are calling, uh, you know, uh, 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 being dissolved because it hasn't met the gender rule. But the system is very patriarchal. But, you know, we are seeing, uh, you know, on the bench the fact that we have two accomplished uh, 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 judges. But certainly, even though uh, the patriarchs didn't get to choose any female representation, uh, you know, the, 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 the female uh, lawyers would have, again, uh, submitted uh, to be amicus of, mm -hmm. um, of, of the court <laughs> thereabout. But I think the fact is that they have to fight for this space because it's an absolutely patriarchal system. It's where there's a lot of male dominance without any regard of whether we've balanced or not. And they sort of move. And they, if you look at the sensitivity of this case, I think both parties certainly they are choosing, uh, you know, uh, accomplished or seasoned uh, 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 councils. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that they are not accomplished or female councils, but you see they have to fight for that space. What happened to Kathy Kilonzo? Where yes. did she go to? What happened to others? Can we get to see them? But at least the argument is, uh, is sort of balanced. And I think it would be, uh, be a freshness uh, uh, to see seasoned uh, female counsel certainly arguing the case for our country because women also need to be part of shaping our political philosophy, which is what such cases do. So uh, I think we're looking at uh, you know, a, space and a, space in this, uh, a space in this country where you know, the, the, the woman professional will be fighting for that space and absolutely abolish the patriarchal system that we have. And I have to, I have to apologize. It is unfortunate that we're discussing the lack of female lawyers uh, female <laughs> advocates in the Supreme Court at the presidential election petition, but also my panel today is just made up of men. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to clarify, we had invited uh, Eunice Lumalas, also an advocate of the High Court, uh, but for some reason she sent an apology. She is not able to make it because this was a, would have been an appropriate uh, question uh, directed at her. Absolutely. Uh, because she is one of those uh, upcoming lawyers, just like Kathy Kilonzo. Uh, she runs a, a, an advocate firm and uh, the reason why we do not see them there and Dennis you pointed it uh, right because uh, we've seen some lawyers actually go before the Supreme Court and even apply to be amicus correct yes yes uh, yet no female lawyer 
because a, a lawyer like lawyer Kanjama who was denied absolutely uh, he applied but was denied but at least he got to address the Supreme Court we still yeah. got to see his face but this time round and let me come to Mark now because this issue about gender is going to be a big issue even after this uh, uh, presidential election petition that is one of the things that parliament has to deal with uh, just achieving the gender parity uh, we're still grappling with that but you can see even going to that we still have a problem even in the courts not that we do not have lawyers uh, who are female there are quite a number Kefi Kilonzo where is her face right now hmm. yes yeah. all these lawyers should at least be seen to even try not just uh, 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 wait uh, to be given an opportunity don't you think Mark you know the most hilarious thing about Kenyans is that we don't look at a narrative from beginning to end. Number one, in our villages, we have Baraza Lawaze. There is rarely a female there. In our political lives, you have never seen a female being anointed an elder of any community. Um, our two principals are elders of every community, depending on which time of the year they went uh, to Llewellyn or Kisiland or Masailand. So the reality of the matter is one of the things that we've not done in Kenya is we've not addressed the issue of gender from the basics of making family decisions. Inclusivity has to start from the home. We have to include our daughters and our mothers and our wives in the decision making of our homes. So the thing is when that is happening we cannot expect that the higher court would automatically have a, a lot of women in it. It is a question that we as Kenyans have to introspect and act actively begin to respect the opinion of women even in dowry negotiations it is hilarious that the people who are being dowried are rarely represented in that case and when they are the women are expected to be quiet these are some of the traditional things that we need to change to bring about a space where the girl child is represented in every matter be it society or political in such an environment then it would be normal for, uh, for women to be represented but in this case where we are just driving from the political side and even the political parties in their basic structures have to be able to encompass women down from the polling station level all the way to the presidential level that's what needs to happen if women are missing from the ballot uh, ballot uh, presidential ballot missing in many of the gubernatorial races then we have a problem as a country in the sense that we are not including women in all of the societal decisions at whatever level and uh, we're talking about all the parties involved in this uh, presidential election petition the petitioner they've not picked any female lawyer to represent them in court IEBC which is the first respondent has not picked any female lawyer to present uh, 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 that commission in court uh, Wafula Chebukati the chairman of the IEBC has not picked any female lawyer to represent him in court and even the third respondent uh, that's uh, President Huru Kenyatta has not picked any female lawyer to represent him in court so this cut, cuts across it's not just the commission it's even the individuals uh, uh, who are uh, parties to this particular petition. But going back to the legal profession, Dunstan, uh, it appears that, like uh, the legal profession, especially in Kenya, is one of those very conservative, very, very, uh, very reluctant uh, to, uh, to embrace change. Uh, and that could just be part of the problem that uh, even embracing more female lawyers, uh, even giving them a seat at the high table, because I, I, we, we see how lawyers treat each other, we see how the younger lawyers treat the senior counsel, and even within the peers, everyone rising up, even though you're representing the other person, they pay homage. Uh, Senator Orengo yesterday was saying, yes, my senior uh, learned uh, uh, counsel, my learned friend, Paul Mwite, who's representing the other side, and you can see the kind of respect they give each other. But we do not see that kind of courtesy being accorded to, the, uh, to probably the female lawyers by being included, and we're talking about inclusivity here, not just uh, uh, issues of gender, it's inclusivity uh, into such opportunities, because this is an opportunity. Lawyer Kanjama was looking for an opportunity to actually probably uh, make his name and uh, grow and uh, 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 at least uh, be seen to perform at an even bigger platform. Don't you think that it's because the legal profession in Kenya is reluctant to change? What I totally don't agree with uh, Fred. The legal profession as it is constituted is only that I was trying to get the exact numbers of female lawyers and male lawyers that have been admitted. We are around 13,700 uh, lawyers in this country. The bigger number of uh, the, the lawyers, the, it's around 50, something 51 to 52 percent 
and uh, the female lawyers will definitely be more uh, as compared to the male lawyers. What is the issue before the court is not about gender issues. It's about the people who are in that court and they have the power to decide without coercion, without any influence, who is best to represent them. They have picked those who are the best to represent them. Are you saying there's no female lawyer who compares to the kind of uh, team of uh, legal counsel that you are seeing before the Supreme Court? What, I, I what I'm saying, there is no legal provision to say how many female or how many males should be in your team. This is an individual's preference. There are people who will go to a doctor who is a male, others will go to a doctor who is a female. The, the deciding factor is the person who is in court. And the people who are in court are six. One, Uhuru Raila Amolo Odinga. He has opted to have the battle of lawyers that he thinks will represent and prosecute his case. When you appoint an advocate, there are very many reasons that somebody opts and decides for one. One, the Supreme Court has very clear regulations. Not every lawyer can address the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. There are years you must have practiced for certain years for you to be allowed to address the Supreme Court. Number two, the client looks at the composition of the judge, the judge, the bench. Who can put my point for that point to be heard? When you look at the composition of that court, seven judges, they are traditional judges, they are conservative judges, they are intellectual judges, they are leisure fair judges. So it depends on who can play very well to present your case. So the right to be represented cannot be regula uh, regulated. Within the legal team, there are very many ladies who are involved in that. For example, when you look at President Uhuru Kenyatta's uh, team, senior Wakili, Mary Karen Surubit, is at the core of that issue of the President's de uh, defense team. And when you look at Raila Odinga, you see Julie Soweto, a very key uh, lawyer in that in that area. So when you look at all the positions there, ladies are there. The only issue you are not forgetting is that it is the right of the person to decide who represents that person. Just like the media here, you cannot compel that put a lady here. It is about the question of preference. So in my own view, the ladies have done tremendously well. The ladies are doing tremendously well. Our lady councils are doing tremendously well. And nobody should underrate that they do not have the capacity, they do not have the professional qualification to argue the cases of. It is only that the people who are in court opted for different lawyers mm -hmm. because of different reasons. So that is the right provided by the Constitution. It is not an admission of that the lady advocates are incompetent or the lady advocates cannot face that, uh, that Supreme Court. They are enough lawyers. But also, when you look at the strain, the physical strain for those lawyers, mm -hmm. I'll tell you it is so draining. That petition you are seeing today started being assembled in 2014. Mm -hmm. The defenses of the IBC started in 2014. The evidence gathering has been ongoing. That matter you are seeing today, people have been failing to sleep for many years. Mm -hmm. For many years. And also, as I've said, there is a the political angle towards that case. When you see people like the former Attorney General, Amos Waku, he is not arguing there. But they, those are the technical people behind the NASA team. When you look at uh, the people in uh, the IBC, they have assembled very old, very experienced technocrat lawyers who are there. So there are very many reasons as to why you'll be allowed to prosecute that case. Also put it in mind that when uh, tw 2002, when Kibaki came, a position called senior counsel was created mm -hmm. 
the senior councils you are seeing there are former law society of Kenya chairmen. Mm -hmm. Most of them were given that position. The senior councils are the people in case there's a dispute to remove the judges. It is the senior councils who will be appointed in that tribunal. So you are looking at a senior council almost at the same age, experience, and date of admission with the judges. Uh, that, is the that is the respect question, that you are seeing. Question, Dunstan, is, do we have any female senior counsel? Uh, I don't think there is any. So there is none? None has ever led okay. the law society of Kenya. Fair enough. But now the law has been made properly, proper procedures to be followed for people to apply to be senior counsels. For now, mm -hmm. I'm not very sure, but I think I've seen Akusala here, my learned colleague, he'll confirm that for now there is no senior counsel who is a lady. And, and it's just in, a historical mistake. Yes, and we, as we usher in probably Boniface Akusala, also another advocate of the High Court, to give us more insight into what's happening at the Supreme Court. Let's engage uh, Mark Bichachi. Uh, of course, we do not, uh, women, female lawyers should not expect to be handed uh, everything on a silver platter. Uh, we should uh, be hoping to see them uh, coming and presenting themselves, even applying uh, to be friends of the court. We've not seen that. And uh, even just looking at the courtroom uh, on the split screen there, it looks like a boys' club. Uh, so many men with very few uh, female lawyers there. Uh, does it feel strange? This is 2017. Fred, if you'll allow me, let me give the data. No, I have the data. Be, oh, I'll come back to you, Bona Dunstan. Uh, uh, let me engage Mark first. You know, the, 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 the most uh, hilarious thing is, let's remember that this is also a political exercise. And as such, um, you expect that you'll also appoint a lawyer that will play to your political advantage. Let's, let's not make a mistake and think that this is a purely legal exercise. The fact that it's being televised on TV, it is an advertisement for, for NASA, it is an advertisement for Jubilee to show off and to show their, their, their intellectual might. And in fact, if you looked at social media yesterday and today, you would be mistaken to think that each side is winning because the party loyalists on either side were loading and uploading the comments of the lawyers they expected to be on their side. So the fact of the matter is, when you're making these decisions, I think it is also affected by who is loyal and powerful in your political uh, sphere and you can see that happening more so on on the on the petitioner's side you see um orengo is a senator and 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 things like that so the, we can't ignore the pr angle we can't ignore the political angle and that then is an indictment on how our political parties are assembled mm -hmm. because if you were to ask yourself who are the female voices within NASA or Jubilee outside of the Supreme Court, outside of uh, the precincts of, 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 of the judiciary? You will find that you run into the same problems, that you can't find a single female voice that is said to be at the same level as Aiden Duale, as, uh, 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 what's his name, um, the Gatundu uh, South MP. So you, you find that this female representation in the Kenyan political sphere is grossly lacking. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the disadvantages that you have when the 2013 um, elections locked out people like Martha Karua who were known to be very vocal. Now you have even less female voices within parliament in as much as we have more women parliamentarians in the sense that not many of them have developed the voice and the gravitas that Martha Karua and Charity Ngilu had in their heyday. Yes. Uh, but uh, let me now welcome Boniface Akusala uh, to the panel. Boniface Akusala is an advocate of the High Court as well. Karibu sana, uh, Wakili. And uh, we're just discussing the lack of female lawyers uh, in this petition, uh, this presidential election petition before the Supreme Court. We even we're just making a quick comparison with uh, the petition of 2013. At least we saw Kathy Kilonzo come out and make a name uh, for herself. Uh, this time round, we're lacking that. Uh, we even just looking at the courtroom. We cannot seem to identify any of those female lawyers because we're not seeing them getting an opportunity to make a presentation before the court. Why is this? First of all, there is Lucy Kambuni who took part in yesterday's submissions. Therefore, it is not accurate to uh, insinuate that women have been sidelined. Nevertheless, I agree with what my learned friend 
uh, Dunstan is saying that there is so much in a legal team apart from what appears before court it is just not about those who present and those who speak submit orally there are those behind the scene uh, I mean technocrats it, and I can assure you there is a big number of female lawyers who have taken part in this uh, petition but it does not mean that because they are not seen at the forefront they are not in the battle mm -hmm. okay uh, <laughs> let's move on from that and now take a look at something else uh, still within uh, the Supreme Court and what we are seeing happening and uh, this argument and I, I put it forth to Dunstan Omari that the legal profession uh, seems to be very conservative very reluctant uh, to change uh, or to embrace change and uh, we've seen that uh, uh, in the issue of dressing yes uh, and uh, uh, let me clear <laughs> one issue yes. Fred, yes, that's right. I have the Law Society of Kenya website in total this country has uh, 14,000 14,000 uh, a total of 14,444 lawyers mm -hmm actually not lawyers they are called advocates mm -hmm. lawyers are students who have just finished from uh, from the university and they have not been admitted as advocates there are 14,444 active advocates in this country female advocates are 6,049 mm -hmm. male advocates are 8,121 8, so there is a, di a disparity of around 2,000 mm -hmm. uh, advocates in terms of gender disparity. So we are telling uh, parents, make sure your daughters come to university, we teach them so that they become and they get to do law and become advocates. Of the Let me deal with the question you've raised about conservative nature of the judiciary. There, is, there are reasons as to why the judiciary must be conservative. There are schools of thought that say the judiciary retains its vitality by being conservative. Within the judiciary itself, there are vibrant people and judicial officers who are transformative. When you look at, for example, the retired Chief Justice Mutunga, then you look at for lawyers, I'm addressing those lawyers, Jerem Bentham, you'll understand that the philosophy of Jerem Bentham was reform the judiciary do not wear those robes that will scare the litigants. Fred, if you go there and you see those red robes, the first thing you say, oh God, I'll be sentenced to death. Mm -hmm. So there are those ones who see the judiciary from a very conservative point of view. The advantage of the judiciary being conservative is one, it assures continuity. Two, it, has, it assures stability. Three, it gives the confidence that we have no problem. I can see my good uh, uh, law lecturer there, Judy Law and Judy Soweto. Don't say that women are not there. There are very many women. By the way, I've just been corrected. There's Lucy Kambuni, uh, who is in the IBC panel, yeah. and Kamene Mbote, yes. a professor of yes. law. Yes. Uh, but uh, I do understand that these two are senior counsels. Bona uh, Akusala. Can you confirm that there are actually female senior counsels in Kenya? Because uh, Dunstan Omari was not so sure. I don't think Actually, we have uh, a list of uh, senior counsel here. Mm -hmm. There is no female counsel. But there is uh, just one, Rachel Mamo. Oh, yeah, yeah, Rachel. Rachel Mamo, former chair of LSK. LSK. Lucy Kambuni is also uh, a yes, senior true. counsel. Other than that, there is no other female uh, senior counsel. So apart from Rachel Omamo and Lucy Kambuni, we yes. do not have any and other female senior counsel. Perhaps just to clarify, this uh, position of senior counsel, just as my learned senior has, uh, uh, has alluded to, was created post the 2002 Kibaki era. And more or less it was, um, we could say, tokenism for those counsel who had been uh, chairs of LSK. Mm -hmm. And then other considerations, of course, um, of the, 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 the president could award that, uh, that position to another lawyer due to experience and such like things. Therefore, while advocates are addressing each other, they in the state of seniority, they acknowledge who is senior, although you will not find someone saying my learned junior because <laughs> it's disrespectful. However, those that have been awarded this position, uh, again, I agree with Dunstan mm -hmm. that 
they take part uh, they take part in a very crucial uh, uh, process in terms of uh, uh, making uh, comments okay. or taking a position in uh, judicial processes. Yes, and uh, we need to thank uh, Senior Counsel uh, Karanja Kabagi who just texted us uh, mm -hmm. with the names of the two female uh, Senior Counsel, that's Lucy Kambuni and Kamene Mbote. Thank you, Bwana Karanja Kabagi, for that. Uh, now we have three names, Rachel Omamo, Lucy Kambuni and Kamene Mbote, who are female Senior okay. Counsel. Uh, thank you for that clarification. Back to the issue of uh, this Away from the lawyers, uh, Dennis, <laughs> I'm sure just as, as an analyst watching the Supreme Court, there's so much that you get to see. Correct. The issue of wigs, for example, mm -hmm. uh, we've seen the judges, uh, they've done away with that. Uh, there was talk that, uh, by last week that we were expecting to see uh, the bench wearing those wigs. We've not seen them doing that. But we can see some of these other senior lawyers, mm -hmm. uh, the Attorney General, uh, Gilum Wigai, former Attorney General Emo Swako insisting on those wigs and also PLO Lumumba had it on. Uh, do you think that uh, probably some of these senior lawyers are very reluctant to move on uh, or to embrace change because even uh, when CJ Mutunga was there uh, I remember him at one time in court telling the lawyers that you do not have to come with that wig but they are still insisting on it. Uh, suddenly, of course, we see the legal profession in this country as a very dignified profession. And that's why the two gentlemen here will keep on referring themselves as my learned friends, <laughs> even as we are learned. <laughs> but however, <laughs> I think it's the issue Don't of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, they need to refer to all of us as learned. But however, you see the distinction in the law, in the, in the, in the legal, legal, um, uh, legal field is that it's a dignified, uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a dignified thing. But also the issue of formality, uh, robing, and I think uh, wigging, I'm not sure whether it's called wigging, is I think to retain that natural uh, formaliz formality that is required and I think distinction between, because uh, this is a practice that largely, uh, I think, came from England, if uh, my learned friends would uh, correct me uh, uh, there about. But however, I think for me, what I see is that, and I come from, a, from, a, uh, from the field of security, is where uh, formalization, retaining formality, and you being identified as who, who you, uh, whoever you are, is a very, very critical thing in terms of the profession that you play. Uh, you know, but for me, I think if I see uh, the weight of this case, and I, uh, personally, and if I see a, a lawyer or a senior counsel, whoever they are, not robing or not wigging, sometimes I may not take them as serious as they are. If I just see the issue of uh, business suits or anything of the sort, there's no clear distinction. Uh, between who is who is who, uh, so I think that robing brings in a, a certain formality and also you know the dignified nature of, um, of, of 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 the practice, which is a good thing for us. Yes. To see. And Charles, of course, the CJ insisted that anyone who is to make a presentation before that court has to be fully and properly robbed. Uh, uh, they have to be in that black robe with a collar uh, thing. This is interesting because we rarely get to see these things. Uh, I know that there are some judges who insist. Uh, even at the High Court or Court of Appeal, that any lawyer appearing before them has to be in the right attire. Uh, but now this is an epitome of this. Well, uh, I think it goes down to the individual judicial philosophy of the, of the judge because uh, what we have now is a comparative analysis between now uh, Chief Justice Maraga and the former Chief Justice uh, Mutunga because uh, when Chief Justice Mutunga came in, he was a bit liberal in his approach and uh, such things were not seen. Even the colors of the, of the gowns were different at that time. Because uh, I remember when Chief Justice Mutunga was in, he even called for uh, a tender to the advertise how to design the gowns and everything. So it was purely uh, an idea of change of uh, just trying to do things differently. But uh, Chief Justice Maraga coming in has really taken back the courts to its traditions of uh, sticking to the old way of doing things, which is even in terms of insisting that when you are before the Supreme Court, you must be in that wig, uh, not, not even the wig, the properly attired. Uh, basically, which is why we are seeing everybody there is in a, even those lawyers, senior lawyers who are not even participating in the process are just coming in as uh, just uh, uh, to witness what is going on are robbed. Mm -hmm. So what we are seeing here probably in my check is, uh, is an effect of the individual judicial philosophy of the judge at the helm of the Supreme Court, which then shows it can even just try, we are looking at a court that is trying to reclaim its traditional uh, and venerated position as that high court which has 
roots that are based in traditions and they really don't want to depart from that because I find it also a bit uh, par a paradox where you say that we should not be whipped but, or uh, be robbed but then the language still remains the same mm -hmm. so if it is something about moving on and changing then let's even drop the lingua and the, and the legal uh, language and speak in a language that everybody understands and so basically the code <laughs> still <laughs> remains very traditional to me yes uh, but the other thing mark and uh, this is very interesting it is 2017 <laughs> but those seven judges of the highest court in the land have to handwrite their notes that everything that is said there, the judges are just busy jotting down everything, all the arguments throughout. Don't you think that's also something that needs to move on? Something that needs to change? You know, uh, I, 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 I am one person who heavily detests the colonial and British way of doing things in the sense that it's steeped on tradition to the point where it, if, if it still is nonsense we still keep doing it and this is what I mean by, by nonsense <laughs> a, a, a typical wig is the cheapest I saw when I did a Google search for a wig is 55,000 Kenya shillings that's the wig average, that they're using yes the average is 250,000 Kenya shillings so number one it is already a statement of, of financial financial status to be able to afford one and to buy something for 55,000 shillings that you'll wear once in five years when the Supreme Court sits is quite uh, hilarious. Number two, if you look at the American <laughs> system, which was also born out of the British system, they let go of a lot of the traditions to embrace um, something that is more practical to their society and still borrowing from that system. Um, the court stenographers are people who are tasked with recording everything that is said within that, that court. And if you've watched American uh, uh, legal dramas, you will see the judge asking for the stenographer or the uh, court recorder to basically read back to him what has been said. And I think that is something that at the Supreme Court level, at least, would expect exists to be able to capture everything within, uh, within that, that particular space. Just the same way as in parliament the Hansard is able to record every single thing and is available by the end of the day every day so the, the technology and the embracing of the demystification of power needs to be something that we as African countries need to embrace you know it's like saying that my child cannot respect me when I'm in pajamas and when I put on a suit he respects me more and he's able to recognize me as a father because I have shaved my beard in a certain way respect is not a about what we create externally and it is this same thing that led the governors to asking for chase cars and having flags and emblems on their cars because we keep thinking that respect can only be created externally no respect should be something that you hold because of the office that you hold and because of the person that you are and the problem of external symbolism of power and respect is you can have a very silly character but because you have chase cars and you have an emblem we respect you no it should be about your personality there are people Fred who walk into a room and you have to respect them because of the air they carry themselves so this season where we have to have emblems and symbols to show respect really needs to end in African culture yes Boniface Akusala to the issue of uh, jotting down notes you can see when there the CJ uh, uh, Maraga busy jotting down and th these are volumes, the kind of uh, uh, presentations being made by the uh, uh, different legal teams is massive there's a lot of uh, things being said and they're, they're sitting for even four, five, six hours non-stop surely there, there must be a better way uh, for the judges to uh, get uh, this information without having to write it down personally that is the best case scenario. That is where I feel we are headed to in the coming few years. However, there are many more challenges that the judiciary right now is facing other than judges writing down their notes. Because I feel there are much more pressing needs. For example, courts in marginalized areas. I feel there we need to, uh, to digitalize our registries. Therefore, judges writing at this age and time uh, is not so much an emergency such that it would uh, occasion a miscarriage of justice. However, it could make work easier. We have to admit it. However, it is not an emergency. Are you saying that it will need a lot of resources to just shift the system and uh, have someone else take down the notes and not the judges themselves? Because they need to be listening to whatever is... I'm not saying they're not, but uh, writing down for six hours non-stop, that must be quite taxing. Well, 
they have been trained to write as uh, advocates speak or litigants speak. However, what I'm saying is it is not entirely about the expense but rather prioritizing the need. Mm -hmm. Because if you find a place somewhere deep within uh, Garsen does not have a court, yeah, it makes it more urgent to establish a court in Garsen than to, uh, to, uh, to invest in, uh, in an alternative system of recording evidence. Mm -hmm. And perhaps just to respond to what my friend has spoken, the reason why we, uh, we, we refer to ourselves as land defenders is because the law is land. When, when you are highly educated, you are highly educated. You, have a you, are, you are a professor, you have several degrees, you are very highly educated, but for you to transform from an educated person to a learned person, you have to pass through the fires of law. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, that's why we, 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 we address ourselves as learned friends because yes. we have learned the laws. And you can already hear Dunster Nomari already <laughs> chuckling in agreement, full agreement about being learned. But surely, Dunstan, back to this issue of writing down notes, don't you find it a bit distracting <coughs> when you're making a presentation before a judge and uh, they're just busy noting down the notes and not looking at you and listening or even looking uh, at how you carry yourself, even your facial expression? Because I know as a lawyer, and we'll be looking at that, uh, there's this thing of flair and how you present your case. But when the judge is just busy writing down notes and not even looking at you, don't you feel a bit uh, distracted? Well, that was what used to be. What is now the, court, uh, the Supreme Court? The stenographers are recording. What the judges are writing are key reminder notes. As an educationist, I'll tell you, Fred, that when you listen and write, you take your footnotes. They will guide you when you have the stenographer. The hearing that we have is recorded in verbatim. The stenographers are there. They will transcribe that what has been given to the to the judge, what was in court. Immediately the judges leave that court. Mm -hmm. They have it by the stenographer. And that is according to the judicial transformation uh, program. Uh, when I read it, by next year, June, all courts will be having that. It will be the death of the long hand where people used to write everything. Technology is in the courts and it also raises an issue that parliament must allocate more resources for the judiciary to make sure that it is digitalized and everything is done by the stenographers. Number two, the judges taking notes. They, when a case is going on, the judges are listening, they're also taking the demeanor. The demeanor is the, the, the way the body language is presenting itself before the court. Whether the judge uh, sees that this advocate is simply lying, it is captured in those small notes that the judges are writing. But as you see, that is the height of great concentration in the judges. Number two, let me defend my legal profession. Mm -hmm. For the first time, I've been, we are being put here whether we are learned or we are educated. <laughs> I put it to everybody that us, it is that we are learned by law. Mm -hmm. We are not learned because people call us at learned by law. And it is the only profession that is reserved for that name. No any other profession, you walk anywhere, you are called, you are learned. Let me ask Kenyans a very simple question. How do you call advocates or, or lawyers? Fred, what is the Kiswahili name? Wakili. Mwenye Akili. It's <laughs> very simple, <laughs> very simple <laughs> that even the language itself has confirmed that this is the only person <laughs> when you are killed. <laughs> no, 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 no. So in my that's own that's view, that's fine. you love that. draw that. I'll apologize for that, but yeah, I've only told you <laughs> that uh, <laughs> the Kiswahili <laughs> version of a lawyer ni mwenye akil. That is the Kamusi definition. I didn't create Swahili. Anyway, that is what I like. Let me move further. Let me move further. Let me move further and bring this to perspective. <laughs> Why this is like this is that in any dispute, a medical dispute, a media dispute, a contract dispute, any issue that arises in any other profession, the person arguing that matter is an advocate. These elections that we are dealing with are ICT elections, digital elections. You've not seen ICT experts there. 
the lawyers are assumed to be able to understand every type of dispute and every type of discipline. So the totality of education in terms of disciplines is put in the hands of the lawyer, is put in the hand of the judges. So that that judge, who is not a media expert, will determine a matter of a dispute within the media fraternity. Okay. And that is why conservatism is so key that if you walk to a court and you find a judge who does not resemble to have that authority, to have that aura and charisma to convince you that my matter is going to be given due regard. Mm -hmm. Therefore, people will lose confidence in the judiciary. And I'm very categorical that if you look at us here, every other time we are wearing ties, it is our mode of dressing. It is almost like the only profession that punishes us even when we are outside the courtroom, I must hold myself as a lawyer. The court, the judicial officers will be judicial officers in a funeral, in a wedding, all over. So, as we live in a, a certain life that is very excluded, that notwithstanding, there are others within our profession that have put that uh, reputation to stake. Those are one or two issues. Well, quite a in number. totality. There, there are quite a number. I, I there, think there are, are a few. One or two. And, and now that you're, <laughs> you're defending your legal profession, I also need to defend uh, <laughs> everyone else. And everyone else's profession. Uh, we will excuse Bonadan Sonomari, uh, the learned friend, uh, <laughs> and Boniface Akusala for defending their profession, the legal profession. Of course, the legal profession is actually at the fo uh, focus, much at the center of the current uh, presidential election petition before the Supreme Court. That's why we're discussing issues surrounding that. We'll continue that. Uh, we need to take a break, but I need to remind our viewers that, yes, you can uh, text us your questions. I just send a text to the number 22422. Uh, you uh, start with the word power breakfast, and we'll be sampling some of those uh, uh, opinions and responses as we continue with power breakfast uh just after the break we'll be looking at some of the speeches the flair how are these lawyers pre presenting themselves and does it have an impact uh on the judges that's after the break <laughs> 